Winter by Marissa Meyer. Now listen to a conversation between Marissa Meyer and Rebecca Solaire. Hi, everyone. This is Rebecca Solaire. I'm the audiobook narrator for the series, and I am so privileged and psyched to be speaking with Marissa Meyer. Hi, everybody. I'm Marissa. I'm, of course, the author of The Lunar Chronicles, and I'm very thrilled to be here as well. Okay, so first things first, how do you feel to be, you know, completely finished with such a, an amazing series? Oh, it's been very bittersweet. On one hand, I'm very excited for the book to be out in the world. Um, I've kind of known how the series was going to end since the very beginning when I first started coming up with the story and the characters. So I'm really looking forward to being able to share the ending with readers, and I hope that they'll uh, find it satisfactory and that they'll, you know, have loved going along on this ride with me. Um, but on the other hand, you know, I've been living with these characters for the last seven years of my life, and it's really sad to be kind of saying goodbye to them and sending them on their way. So it's it's a very bittersweet thing. Personally, I loved being able in this last book to really see Luna for the first time and see the people of Luna and and see how the disparity, you know, in terms of how people were living, the citizens versus the the aristocracy. I'm really glad that you made that change and had Scarlet kidnapped and brought to right. Luna. <laughs> well, thank you. It was a lot of fun, and it gave me, um, you know, having uh, changing it so that Winter and the crew now ends up in one of the outer sectors. And I always thought we would end up in the outer sectors eventually anyway because that, you know, made the most sense for where the uprising would start. Um, but having that more personal connection and developing that, uh, friendship between Winter and Scarlet and both of them kind of getting to see the outer sectors and, and you know, Wolf family and, and all of these other little things together, um, I felt uh, had much bigger impact. Your attention to detail and just the way that you would weave in just little little plot lines was just something as a reader and as the narrator I loved to discover. Like, for example, learning that Wolf never had a tomato, not because of, you know, him being a wolf, but rather because in the outer sectors they they weren't um, given access to fresh produce was so devastating and also such like a little nugget of uh, exploration that like you got to find as a reader. It was a really cool detail. Well, thank you. And I feel as a writer, so often those little details um, kind of surprised me. Like, it's, it's one of those weird things of being a writer that you don't always feel like you're totally in control. You don't always feel like it's you writing the story. Um, you know, sometimes I'll be writing along and a little detail will just, you know, come out of my fingers and onto the page. And I think, oh, wow, so that explains so much. I had no idea. Um, and so I always feel like I'm discovering the world and the characters uh, for the first time as, as long as well as the reader. Were there other fairy tales that you explored potentially weaving in, or were there any that you wished you had the opportunity to sort of explore, or any that you would revisit in a different capacity? Oh, sure, tons. Um, when I was first planning, I had a whole list of fairy tales that I wanted to include, um, and the one that almost made it into the series was Puss in Boots, oh. um, yeah, which is one of my favorite fairy tales, and... Uh, so originally I had planned for this to be a five book series and Puss in Boots was going to be the final in the series. But then as I was outlining and, and figuring out how all these stories fit together, it became pretty clear pretty quickly that it just didn't fit and wasn't working. Um, so it didn't, Puss in Boots didn't last very long in the planning process. Um, but there was a time when I thought I was going to do a, a Puss in Boots book as well. Uh, but now, I mean, I still love fairy tales. I would love to someday do a Rumpelstiltskin retelling. Um, I would love to do a Bluebeard retelling at some point. Uh, but I don't know that they will be um, sci-fi or Lunar Chronicles related or possibly something completely different. Or if I'll even ever do them at all. But those are definitely two fairy tales that I see lots of potential for. Oh, those are really, really interesting. I will say that we have a, a short story collection coming out called Stars Above in February, 
Um, and there is an epilogue type story in that collection that will take place about two years after the end of winter. Um, and I, I'm, I don't know, I'm trying to think, what am I allowed to say about it? Um, I can tell you that there is a wedding, but that is all I'm going to say. Oh, that's so awesome. <laughs> I loved the countries that you chose to become. Why did you choose those particular countries as being part of the, the futuristic Earthen Union? Well, I chose the places, the settings that I would set the stories in largely um, based on kind of these little fairy tale details. Um, for example, many scholars think that the first recorded version of Cinderella um, comes to us from 9th century China. Um, so that's why I selected China for um, Cinder's story. Um, and with Scarlet, I wanted some place that had um, a, a history of werewolves or werewolf mythology. And there's werewolves across so many different cultures, but that's still left it pretty open. Um, but a lot of the werewolf myths that we have today, as far as uh, the silver bullet killing a werewolf and, and little things like that, um, comes to us out of France. So that, that selected France for Scarlet's story. Um, and then in Rapunzel, uh, depending on the version of Rapunzel that you read, um, when she is cast out of the tower, some versions say that she was cast out into a great desert. And when I think great desert, I think of the Sahara. And so that's how, how we ended up with Northern Africa um, being being pressed. So that's kind of how I selected the, those specific areas to tell the stories. Uh, but as far as making the six Earth and nations, um, a lot of it was for convenience. I wanted to have a world, um, A, that had world peace. And I feel like as long as we have hundreds and hundreds of countries, that's pretty unlikely. Um, I feel like it's a lot easier for six world leaders to get together and talk than hundreds of world leaders. Um, and then also I wanted uh, the world leaders and Kai specifically to be able to make decisions that would have huge sweeping consequences for large parts of the world. Um, so I, I wanted to narrow it down to um, just a few countries, and I wanted the Eastern Commonwealth um, to be a huge world leader in that regard. Um, and so then I looked at a map and just kind of penciled out uh, boundaries that seemed logical to me based on our, our current countries and cultures. and those became the Earth and Nations. There wasn't a whole lot of science to it beyond that point. I personally have loved going on your website and seeing all of the artwork that gets sent yeah. into you. Has that, I mean, similarly, here are people reading your books and then creating their versions of what they think the characters look like. I mean, ha how has that been? It is so cool. Seeing fan art is probably my favorite thing about being a published author. Um, it's not only a huge honor to know that you've inspired someone to create something um, and that they've loved the characters enough that they want to, to create their own renditions of them, um, but it's, it's true. It, it brings them to life in a way uh, that I couldn't do just with pen and paper um, or computer and paper. Um, yeah, so I, I love seeing fan art, and some of them are spot on. Some of them just nail the characters and just take my breath away that that is, that is exactly how I pictured them. Um, and others aren't, aren't quite what I had in mind, but that's the wonderful thing about fandoms and, and having to this community kind of rise up out of the stories is that everyone can make their own interpretations of them, which I think is fantastic. One of my personal favorite things about just the way that the whole book is art directed is I love, A, the quotes that you use with every introduction of every book and the artwork that they use, where do you get, how hard is it to select like the one distilled thought after, you know, you introduce book one of say like with winter right now, the young princess was as beautiful as daylight. She was more beautiful even than the queen herself. How hard is it to narrow it down? They change constantly. That quote, the first quote in winter was actually something completely different up until, um, gosh, I think I changed it in copy edit again. Um, so it, it changed constantly. And actually, I think, because they had put, oh gosh, let me think. They had put the, a chapter from Winter or a couple chapters from Winter in the end of Ferris. 
And I believe that that has the old quote in it. So it's actually changed from when they did that. Um, so it, it changes constantly. I'm constantly changing my mind about what quotes are going to, to be best and set the mood and, you know, tell the reader where we're going with this first part of the book but not give too much away. Um, it, it's hard. And I do write all of the quotes myself. Um, I, I go back and I read some uh, translations of the fairy tales and kind of choose a thought or a, a part of the fairy tale that I want to highlight, but then I write my own version of that line and, and often will tweak it to more fit um, my stories, so, which is fun. I love doing it. And that's part of the reason I think that they change so much is because I'm constantly wanting to go back and change it and make it stronger and make it better. And um, it's the, the perfectionist in me coming through. So what's the difference between Marissa pre-Cinder to Marissa post-Winter? Oh, gosh. <laughs> um, God, good question. Uh, I'd love to say that I'm so much more confident in my writing, and I feel like I've got it all figured out, uh, but that is not at all the case. I feel like you just get more and more self-conscious as you go along. Um, uh, I don't know. I mean, I definitely feel that I've grown uh, extensively as a writer. Um, I think when I first started writing this series and I planned it out and thought, okay, I'm going to write this four book series and there's going to be, you know, these eight main characters and all these secondary characters and subplots in this epic world. And, um, I look back on it now and I think, what were you thinking, Marissa? You, you were not capable of writing this story. Um, but I, I did it and I feel like now, you know, I grew so, so much, and it's, anyways, I guess it's hard to describe, because I feel like the Marissa that I was when I wrote Cinder was not capable of writing Winter, um, but because each book gradually got more complex, um, I, I forced myself to grow and learn uh, over the books, and in the end, hopefully I, I nailed Winter and did a good job with it, and I don't think that I could have done it um, as my first book. So I definitely think that I grew a lot as a writer in, in learning uh, just elements of the craft and storytelling. I can't thank you enough for, as a fan and as, an, as a narrator, like, you know, gigs like this come along very rarely. So thank you so much. Oh, I'm so glad that you had fun. <laughs>